continues. Well, when you're ready to start, let me know. Okay, uh, I guess we, it's probably on time right now. Um, yep, it's seven o'clock, so we should definitely start. Um, okay. okay, I'm Selena. Um, I'm from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester. And I would like to introduce, I'm sure everybody, um, everybody knows uh, this is J.A. Jantz, who's a mystery writer. Uh, and she has also written some poetry I, I've heard. Um, and I'm, I'm going to let her actually introduce herself because she has a lot to say and she's written uh, in several, um, several different series and um, she's a best-selling author. And so I'm going to let her introduce herself and just talk, <laughs> okay? Just talk, that's all. Just talk, yeah, J.A. Jantz. The book tour, the vir this is my first virtual book tour. And I love speaking in front of audiences. Speaking in front of a camera is actually terrifying to me. So I want people to know that today I will be doing this with the help of Mary. You can see her cuddle up in my lap. Mary is a long haired miniature dachshund and she is my virtual book tour support animal. She, uh, she makes me, she keeps me company and she makes me smile so I look less like my mother and someone who has well, swallowed a prune. <laughs> uh, I think first I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. I. Uh, I was born in South Dakota. I grew up in Bisbee, Arizona, a copper mining town in the southeastern corner of Arizona. And from the time I was in second grade and read The Wizard of Oz, I wanted to be a writer. I, I read The Wizard of Oz and I didn't much care about the wizard hiding behind the curtain. What I cared about was Frank Baum hiding behind the words. And once I knew that a person, a living, breathing person, put those words on the pages, that's what I wanted to be and that's what I wanted to do. And so I grew up, I won a scholarship to the University of Arizona. Because I wanted to be a writer, I signed up to be an English major. And then the summer before my junior year, when it was time to be signing up for those upper division courses. I was working in the English department and I was putting mail into the faculty slots. And the professor who taught the creative writing course came into the room and I said, oh, I'm, I'm hoping to sign up for your class this fall. And he looked at me and he said, you're a girl. And I said, so? He said, girls become teachers or nurses, boys become writers. And he wouldn't let me into his class. So I married a guy who was allowed in the creative writing class that was close to me. Uh, my first husband imitated Faulkner and Hemingway primarily by drinking too much and writing too little. He never had anything published, but that didn't keep him from, tell it, from telling me in 1968 after we got married there's only going to be one writer in our family, and I'm it. And so while I was married to him, I put my writing ambitions on hold. I mentioned he had a drinking problem. It was a serious drinking problem, and I didn't start figuring that out until after we were married. We were teaching on an Indian reservation. We lived in a little house on a volcanic knoll, 30 miles west of Tucson, at th beyond three, seven miles beyond Three Points. And then we taught at a school on the reservation that was another 30 miles west of where we lived. The house we lived in was two miles off the highway, 
seven miles to the nearest neighbor and or telephone. And so in the evenings, my husband would be passed out by 6.30 or seven o'clock at night. And I was there by myself. And so I would sit at the dining room table and jot off these little bits of poetry. At the time I was writing them, I thought I was being true to my art. I, I knew I wasn't being true to him because I wasn't supposed to be writing. So every night after I finished, I hid the poetry away in a strong box and he, he never saw it. Um, I knew the strong box, box was a place he would never go looking. When my daughter was born in 1972, he was, uh, my husband went on a drinking bender and was drunk the whole time I was in the hospital having the baby. And when it was time to leave the hospital, he showed up drunk and I had this terrible choice to make. Do I have him drive the car or hold the baby or do I drive the car and have him hold the baby. And so I drove myself home from the hospital, 35 miles. And that was the beginning of a long decline. I, I he spent uh, between 1972 and 1980, he was hospitalized nine times for chronic alcoholism. Uh, in 1980, he showed up at my six year old son's T-ball game so drunk that when the game was over, he crawled on his hands and knees from the bleachers to the car. And that was when I finally got a divorce. 18 months after I divorced him, he died. He died, uh, he went into DTs. He was hospitalized with no kidney or liver function. He died a month later. And When I divorced him, we were still living in Phoenix when I divorced him. And uh, I knew if I stayed around Phoenix, I was going to take him back. So the kids and I did an adventure in moving. We packed our goods into a U-Haul trailer and took off for Seattle, where I moved in to a condo with my, my older sister. And while I was there, someone heard me tell a story about an encounter we had with a serial killer in 1970. And when I told that story, somebody said, well, someone should write a book about that. And I thought, well, I'm divorced. What have I got to lose? And so I started writing my first book. It was essentially a true crime book. It was 1400 pages long. Nobody ever bought it. But writing that book, taught me how to write. It was on the job training, <laughs> unpaid on the job training. <laughs> My first husband died on the first, uh, on New Year's Eve, 1982-83. And in February of that year, when it was time to get out all the documents you have to present when somebody, uh, when somebody dies, I got out the strong box and there was all that poetry. And when I read through it, I could see I wasn't being true to my art when I was writing that. I was being a writer and using words to deal with the central issues of my life. When I showed the poetry to someone else, they said that that should be a book. And so it is a book. It's called After the Fire. And Annie's can get the, the book for you. It is in print. Uh, the title poem in that book goes like this. I have touched the fire. It burned me, but I knew I lived. It seared me, but it made me whole. He called me. I went gladly, though I saw the rocks, fell laughing through the singeing air. I have known the fire. I'll live with nothing rather than with less. The flame is out. There's nothing left but ash. 
The thing about being in a relationship with uh, an addict of any kind is that you feel so alone. You feel like you're the only person who could ever possibly have been dumb enough to fall for all those lies. And, and one of the wonderful things about after the fire, and one of the reasons I talk about it, is that when I hear from people who have read it, people who need to have that book in their hand, they tell me how reading that poetry made them feel less isolated and alone. But in the meantime, I had started writing. When nobody bought that first book, my agent suggested that I write another book. And so she said, well, why don't you write something that's completely fiction this time? And so I decided to write a book set in Seattle. I was living in Seattle at the time. And so I created my first published book. It's called uh, Unto Proven Guilty. And that featured my Seattle homicide cop, J.P. Boma. When I met Bo, he was mid forties. I, he and I are exactly the same age. Uh, it's hard to remember all of my kids, all of my grandkids, now my great grandkids' birthdays. And when you add in all of this, those characters' ages and birthdays as well, it's just way too much to remember. So I cheated with Bo. I gave him my birthday. So we're exactly the same age, and I, so far I can still remember that. <laughs> But the Beaumont books are written in the first person through JP's point of view. And he couldn't be at work all the time. He had to do something uh, when he wasn't working. And writers are supposed to write what you know. And it turns out I knew a whole lot about drinking. So I had Bo do the same kind of drinking that I had lived with for 18 years of my life. And then the fourth book, I was signing uh, books in Portland and a lady came up to the table and said, you know, Bo drinks every day. He has a drink of choice and it's starting to interfere with his work. Does J.P. Beaumont have a problem? <laughs> I said, you know, these are books. But it turns out several other people asked me the same question. And that's when I realized that Bo really did have a drinking problem. So he ends up going into treatment in book number eight. And there are now 25 Beaumont books. And so there are a lot more books with him drinking, or sober, than there were with him drinking. Some people still tell me they prefer him. They liked him better when he was drunk, and I worry about them. But... Um, I've had people write to me and say that watching Bo deal with his alcohol problem helped them deal with theirs. And that's sort of the magic of writing. You're, you're telling a story, and yet what goes through the minds of whoever's on the other side of the page is, can be way more impactful than the writer expects it to be. I could never be um, Sue Grafton. I could never sit down and write uh, 26 books in a row about one character. I have a limited attention span. So after I had written nine books, uh, my editor suggested, I, I said, okay, the next book, I'm just gonna knock Bo off. And my editor said, oh, don't do that, write something else. Why don't you rework that first book you wrote, the one that was never published, and we'll turn that into your first uh, hardback. And so I wrote the first Walker family book, Hour of the Hunter, which is vaguely remade, related to our serial killer experience from 1970. It's not truly that book because it turns out that serial killer is still in prison in Arizona and I didn't want to write something that would make him say, oh, they're writing a book about me. So Hour of the Hunter is very different from that original case. 
But there are some things about it that are surprisingly true. Um, the main character in the book, Diana Ladd, is a woman who's a teacher on an Indian reservation, but she really wants to be a writer. Like me, she had a husband who was allowed in the creative writing class that was closed to her. Ah, her husband is dead at the beginning of the book. And as for the crazed killer, he turns out to be a former professor of creative writing from the University of Arizona. <laughs> Don't you just love it when that happens? That was my first real experience with writerly revenge. Someone asked me the other day, well, what about your creative writing? What does your creative writing professor think about your writing career now? Well, it turns out that both my first husband and the creative writing for professor were dead by the time my first book was published. However, every time one of my books hits the New York Times list, I'm pretty sure they're both spinning in their graves. So when I went back to writing the Beaumont books after writing Hour of the Hunter, it was fun again. And uh, by the way, Hour of the Hunter in the background of the Walker family books are the people I met and the things I learned while living on the, on the reservation. And uh, I think I, people who've never been to Arizona can really gather a lot of information about Native American living uh, from reading the Walker family books. But Bo was fun again. And so then my editor said, well, why don't you come up with a new character? Why don't you write, uh, then you could alternate between Bo and someone else. So I created Joanna Brady. Joanna Brady is a sheriff in Cochise County where I grew up. I knew a lot about living in Arizona. I knew way more about living in Arizona at that point than I knew about living in Seattle. Bo was a male homicide detective. I've never been a male homicide detective. Uh, and writing his books in first person was really tough. So I decided, okay, I'll have a female protagonist. I'll set it in Arizona. And that's how I came up with Joanna Brady. You can't tell by my sitting here how tall I am. But if I stood up, you would see that I am actually six foot one. And I've always wondered what it would like to be short, what it would be like to be short. And so I had Joanna Brady be short. Uh, her height sometimes is 5'2 and sometimes is 5'4. I think we've pretty permanently settled on 5'4 now. So that's, that's Joanna Brady. And again, I could alternate between Beaumont and Brady with the occasional walker thrown in. And that was one for a time. And then my attention span got in the way. And by the, by the late 90s, I was tired of all of those guys. So I was complaining on the phone to my editor. And she said, well, OK, come up with a new character. Can be, uh, it come up with a book. It can be a new character, old character. Set it wherever you like. But just have it here by the 1st of January. Well, it was the middle of May. Write a book between May and January, I can do that. And so I signed a contract and they sent me a check and they gave me a deadline. May and June passed, June and July passed, August and September passed and suddenly it was the middle of October and I had no idea who was going to be in that book that I needed to have in New York by the 1st of January. When I have writer's block, and that was a very serious case of writer's block, I compulsively watch the news. And so I did. We were in Tucson. We had a second home in Tucson at the time. And at noon on a Thursday in October, 
I turned on the TV room and the family room and I watched the, the new news. My favorite newscaster, Patty Weiss, was on the air. Five o'clock in the afternoon came. I still had writer's block. I turned the news back on. Patty Weiss wasn't there. And nobody said that she was on special assignment. Nobody said she was on vacation. She just wasn't there. So over, over that weekend, the other news outlets in town, KOLD and um, KGUN, let people know what had happened to Patty Weiss. She was 53 at the time. She had worked at KVOA Channel 4 for, uh, from the time she was still in college. And that afternoon, between the new news and the five o'clock news, her 35-year-old news director came to her at her desk, told her she was too old to be on TV, and escorted her from the building. Now, here's something you may not know about Mr. Writers. It's a bad idea to make us mad because we have our ways of getting even. And within minutes of finding out what they did to Patty Weiss, I was writing a book about someone named Allie Reynolds being yanked off her news anchor desk in LA for the same reason her, her news director thought she was too old. At the time she's yanked off her desk, she finds out that her second husband is a philanderer. And uh, so with her life in California, a shambles, she comes back to her hometown of Sedona, Arizona to duct tape her life back together again. Why Sedona? Well, my favorite place in Arizona is, is Tucson. I grew up in Bisbee. But next up is definitely Sedona. So I put Allie in Sedona. And sure enough, I had that book in New York by the deadline, the 1st of January. That book is called Edge of Evil. So that was Allie number one. And Credible Threat is Allie number 15. I write series of books. and. People turn up in books, characters turn up in books, and sometimes I think they are one book characters, and then they surprise me and <laughs> they don't go away. That certainly happened to Butch Dixon in the Joanna Brady books. I thought, I thought uh, Butch was a one book wonder, but he kept coming back book after book. And now of course he and Joanna Brady are not only married, they just had their second child. And the same thing, Mary has had enough of the interview. She, she's going away. She said, I've done what I can for you. Either you're, you're now you're on your own. Uh, in the Allie Reynolds books, B. Simpson showed up. He wouldn't go away. And now B. Simpson and and Allie Reynolds are married. <sighs> Sister Anselm Becker showed up in book Allie number five, Trial by Fire. And she hasn't gone away either. And because Sister Anselm was a patient advocate, going to hospitals and intervening between patients and advocating for patients with the, med med the medical providers, the, the health providers. Uh, that was her job, but the reason it was her job is she, it was a mission established by Archbishop Francis Gillespie, the Archbishop of uh, the Archdiocese of Phoenix. I thought Archbishop Gillespie was a one book wonder, but see, you can't, you can't trust characters. Just because you expect them to go away doesn't mean they actually will go away. So
So the Archbishop has turned up in several books. He and Allie's husband, B, have become friends. And when, Greta, when Credible Threat starts, Archbishop Gillespie comes to B and Allie and asks for help from them and their cybersecurity company, High Noon Enterprises. He asked for help because he has been receiving death threats and he doesn't want to make a big fuss about it. He went to the Phoenix PD about it and they said, oh, you know, you're, you're a public person and people in the public get all these kinds of anonymous threats and it's just not that big a deal. In fact, it's not a credible threat. And that gave me a title for the book. So, our, the Archbishop doesn't really want to make a big hullabaloo about this, but he is concerned because if someone is trying to kill him, he's in his 80s. If he dies, it's not that big a deal. But his whole life has been devoted to saving people's souls. And if he can prevent someone from killing him, if he can keep from being murdered, he can perhaps save his would-be killer's soul. So that's the background for Credible Threat, and that is the starting point. What I didn't expect when I wrote Credible Threat <laughs> is that I would end up really liking the killer. <laughs> That was, see, you can't trust characters. You just can't trust them. So who is the murderer here? Well, it turns out to be Rachel. Rachel is a woman in her 70s. She is apparently normal. Her, um, her husband is retired, but not really happily so. Their lives sort of fell apart after their son, their only child, died of a drug overdose. And her husband sort of went haywire and he spends most of his time out in the garage working on board houses and Rachel is kind of alone. She doesn't have the kind of, of money she used to have and she's just kind of stuck in limbo in the same way her husband is. And when she finds out early in the book, in the prologue, in fact, that her son was the victim of a predatory priest when he was attending a very expensive private school, she finds out, yes, he died of a, died of a drug overdose, but she believes that he died of that drug overdose because what had happened to him in high school left him so damaged that he could see, he couldn't see a way forward. And that was how he fell into drugs and how he eventually died. So Credible Threat is the story of this 71 year old woman gradually transforming herself from being an ordinary person into being a serial killer. <sighs> you know, the author's history goes into, into every story somehow. And that's certainly true for me. I think if you look at my catalog of books, you'll find that childhood sexual abuse often plays a part in, in the background. Um, in Beaumont number one, Onto Proven Guilty, you will meet a character called, named Ann Corley. And Ann Corley is this gorgeous woman who comes streaking through J.P. Beaumont's life. She actually, 
he actually catches sight of her first walking across a cemetery wearing this bright red death dress and he falls for her hook line and sinker without having any concept that she is actually the suspect in the case he is actively investigating. The case revolves around uh, a religious cult. And in that religi religious cult, the, the cult leader takes Bible verses and uses them to justify all kinds of aberrant behavior. And Ann Corley, who saw her sister victimized when they were both children, is this one woman vigilante going out into the world and taking care of pedophiles who would otherwise get away with it. After the fire was published, or I'm sorry, Unto Proven Guilty was published in June of 1985. For my 45th birthday in 19, uh, whatever year it was, it was five years later, five years after the book was published. I can't do math in my head. I'm a liberal arts major. If I could do math, I wouldn't have to write books. Um, I decided to, I heard that there was a school in the Seattle area, uh, in the Lake Washington School District, that for 20 minutes a day, shut everything down, and everyone in the school, the teachers, the custodians, the ladies in the cafeteria, the secretaries, everybody had to read for pleasure for 20 minutes. And I thought, you know, I write for pleasure. I need to support this program. So I called the principal and eventually I talked my way into doing a presentation to their school. There were 1600 kids in the school and I said, I'd like to come to your school I'd like to do an hour long presentation and I'd like to do it for free. And he said, well, you know, we have this little auditorium and it holds 400 kids. Wouldn't you like to have the kids in the auditorium? And I said, no, I don't want to do four presentations. I want to come to your school. I want to speak to all of the kids for an hour. And finally, I sold life insurance for 10 years. If you sell life insurance, the life underwriting school, the training school teaches you to take 10 no's and get the appointment, take 10 no's at the appointment and still walk away with an application or a check. So eventually the principal agreed to let me come and do a presentation in the gym in front of all 1600 kids at once. And so I went and I talked about onto proven guilty. And when I opened it up for uh, questioning, a kid way up on the bleachers stood up and said, where did Ann Corley come from? And standing there in front of 1600 kids, it was as though a light bulb went off in my head and I understood exactly where Ann Corley came from. She came from me. As a seven-year-old kid, while visiting the family farm in South Dakota, I was molested by my grandfather. I didn't tell. I figured if it was my word against the word of the pillar of the Lutheran church in Marvin, South Dakota, who was going to believe me? Besides, I somehow thought that whatever had happened was my fault, so I didn't I didn't tell. But of course, pedophiles don't have just one victim. And there were four girls in our family. And he molested all of us. And none of us told. We told one another eventually. 
but we didn't tell anybody else. I was 29 years old, teaching on the reservation. My grandfather died and my father came to the house to visit. And we were sitting in the house on the hill and I, he said, I, I just don't understand why none of my daughters came to my father's funeral. And I thought, well, you know, I guess somebody ought to tell him. And so I did. And when I finished telling him, he stood up, he walked across the room and he stood staring out the, win the window at Kitt Peak for the longest time. And then he spun around and he said, if I'd have known that, I'd have taken my shotgun and I'd have killed the son of a bitch. It's the only time in my whole life I ever heard my father use a curse word. But that instant belief from him, the fact that he never for even a second questioned that what I told him was true, really, it was part of my healing process. It was as though he had taken that whole burden away. And I think that's part of how I was able to write Anne Corley in both realistically and believably, but in a way that was invisible to me. And so that aspect of my life is often at play in my books. And it was certainly at play in writing Credible Threat. And it's why when I wrote Rachel, I could understand her feelings. I could understand what, what she was thinking and how it was compelling her in this direction. And I, since the book came out, I have heard from two people, two of my readers, who had brothers who were victimized by predatory priests. And they too told me that they totally uh, identified with Rachel and her struggle and understood exactly, exactly where she was coming from. Uh, that is a credible threat is Joanna Brady, is Allie Reynolds number 15. I'm at work on Allie Reynolds number 16. As of two days ago, it has a name. That book is now called Unfinished Business. I have a new Joanna Brady book called Missing and Endangered that is due out in February of next year. So, you know, I'm fully employed. People say, well, how come you're still writing two books a year? Well, in our family, I'm I'm married to my second husband, the nice one, as opposed to my first husband, the jerk. And actually, I say that, and I probably shouldn't. Uh, in terms of husband material, my first husband was a dead loss. But from the point of being a mystery writer, the guy was a gold mine. If, it hadn't, if I hadn't been married to Jerry Jans, how would I ever have known what it felt like to be hiding behind a tree outside a dive bar in Hammond, Indiana, because a, gunshot, a gunfight had broken out inside? You know, that's, that's a personal experience. You just, you don't get it any other way but by living it. Um, but my, I actually met Bill, my second husband, the week before my, uh, my first Beaumont book was published, I was invited to do a poetry reading of After the Fire at a widowed retreat. And while I was there at that widowed retreat, I met this guy whose first wife, Lynn, had died on the same day of the year as my first husband died. They, they both died a few minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve. So we met on the 21st of June. We got married on the 21st of December. We were in love. Our five adolescent children were not in love. So that was, <laughs> that was interesting. But uh, 
Bill, my second husband, we we just celebrated the 35th anniversary of of the day we met. We broke lock, lockdown and actually went out to have a very nice dinner, uh, a socially distanced dinner at a restaurant that was very careful about maintaining space. Uh, but Bill says that my first husband was so bad that it's made his life perfect. <laughs> so in our family, I write the books and he writes the checks. And he is, he sort of writes checks at a pace of two books a year. So as long as he's still writing checks at that rate, I need to continue writing two books a year. So that's who I am and where I am. And so are there are there any questions? Does anyone have a question? Okay, um, I guess if you do have a question, I, 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 everybody's muted now. Um, so if you do have a question, you can press your space bar and it will unmute you. Does anybody here have a question? Or you could also um, click on chat and uh, you can type a question. Does anybody have a question? So we're, we're living in lockdown. My husband has underlying health issues. And so during COVID, we've had to be very careful. He's, uh, we have seen grandchildren, but only in the backyard for socially distanced meals. And, uh, but I've been maintaining my step uh, count. I, five years ago, I was someone who was not athletically inclined in any direction, but at the uh, five years ago, our doctor got finally got my attention. He would ask me if I exercise, and I said, "Well, I get my most of my exercise by jumping to conclusions," and <laughs> that was not really an acceptable answer. So he finally said, "You've got you've got to get walking," and so. Five years ago, I started walking. I didn't start keeping track on my iPhone until a while in, but last week I crossed my uh, 8 million step mark. And I, according to my iPhone, I have now walked from New York to San Francisco. I did not cross searing deserts or vast plains I didn't climb over mountain ranges in during blizzards. I mostly uh, walked around our backyard and around the pool deck so on totally flat surfaces, by the way. But it's still a lot of steps. And it's the idea that I've walked the distance of the Transcontinental Railroad is something that's pretty impressive. So one of the ways I've been able to keep my sanity during lockdown is I'm out getting my 10,000 steps almost every day. That's, that's incredible. Um, I, I, you answered like all the questions that I had to ask you pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, and I, I wanted to tell everybody if, if you uh, do want to um, get a few other answers for, to some of the questions, uh, Annie's Bookstop of Worcester um, does have a a great uh, blog that we've done on, on JA. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to look at our Facebook page, uh, Annie's Bookstop of Worcester's Facebook page. Um, we have uh, a, um, a blog, uh, it's a author spotlight on AJ Ants. It's up now. So if you want to look at it, she's answered some great questions also. It, I'd like and, to ask a question. I am muted, I think. Yeah, I did. I'm Judy, may I ask a question? Of course. Um, if, if you are so prolific, that you write two books a year. What kind of a writing, I don't know whether you call it style or work day do you have? And how long does it usually take you to write a book? I read the Allie uh, Reynolds series. I've read all the Joanna um, Brady series. Well, you should give Beaumont a try. You might like him. But um, I met outlining in Mrs. Watkins' sixth grade geography class at Greenway School in Bisbee, Arizona, 
I hated outlining then. Nothing that has happened to me in the intervening decades has changed my mind about outlining. So I don't outline. I write murder mysteries, so I usually start with somebody dead. And then I spend the rest of the book trying to find out who did it and how come. Uh, I usually start at the beginning and I write to the end. When, when I first started writing, I was a single parent with two little kids, a full-time job selling life insurance. And the only time I had to myself was from four o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the morning when I got the kids up to go to school and got me dressed to go sell life insurance. And you know, I went to, I, when the kids went to bed at 8.30, I went to bed at 8.30, but I never had to set an alarm because my eyes always popped open at four o'clock and by 4.10, I would be at my computer writing. So now the kids are all raised and gone and I'm, Bill and I are empty nesters. So my life has changed. I, I don't have to write from four to seven in the morning. I usually get up. My commute is from the bedroom all the way to the coffee machine in the kitchen. I pick up my computer. I open my emails first. I respond to every email that comes in. The, even, even the cranky ones. I respond to the cranky ones, ones too. Um, because the people who are writing to me are, are my readers. And readers are my bread and butter. Actually, I'd like to talk about one of those one of those cranky emails right now because Judy, this is this is part of how my process works. I was writing the first email. I, I'm sorry, I was writing the first Allie Reynolds book, Edge of Evil. I was in Tucson. Uh, it was a much longer walk from the bedroom to the coffee pot in in Arizona. So I'd go, I'd start the coffee, and then I'd open my emails. And one morning I opened my email and it said, the, the subject line to the first email on my list said, Jesus, you're an ugly broad. And I thought, whoa, maybe this is spam, but I opened it. And the email went like this, and I remember it verbatim. Dear Ms. Jens, I have just visited your website and seen your photo. Jesus, you're an ugly broad. I do hope when you go out in public, you wear a bag over your head so you don't frighten people. And I hope before your next book tour, you will visit a cosmetic surgeon and have some very necessary work done. Sincerely, Melissa. Gee, she didn't even have balls enough to say her name. But my email says I respond to all emails. And if I didn't answer her, then that was a response. So while my fingers were still shaking with outrage, I wrote, Dear Melissa G, thank you for writing. Your input is appreciated. Regards, dear agent, and sent it out. But I was writing a book. And it's a very bad idea to make Mr. Writers mad. And here, Allie Reynolds, back home in Sedona, with her life blown up, she had been cut loose from everything in her life, her job, her marriage, her home. And so she started a blog called cutlooseblog.com. And you know, by some strange coincidence, someone named Melissa G sent that exact email straight to Allie's blog. And so all of Allie's readers and blog friends were able to weigh in and say, what a terrible thing. They thought, what a terrible person they thought Melissa G was. I actually, I, when I started selling books, I would call the people in my insurance Rolodex. There were about 250 names in there and I'd let them know that a book was coming out. We called it the doghouse list because our grand opening signings were always held at this sort of dive restaurant. 24 hour restaurant in downtown Seattle. So now the doghouse list has morphed into an email list with more than 13,000 names on it. That's what 35 years in the writing business will, will do for you. So 
in the email list, I actually have someone named Melissa G. But it's not that Melissa G. And whenever I sign a book for her, she has me sign it to Melissa G, comma, the good one. <laughs> but that's part of my process. I pick things up as I'm going down the road. And those things, conversations I overhear, people I meet, those somehow find their way into the book I'm writing. And so it's, it's a lot more spontaneous than it is planned. I was writing the second Beaumont book. I was 70 pages from the end when I find, found out the guy I thought was the killer didn't do it. And people ask me later, well, didn't you have to go back and change uh, the clues? And I said, no, I didn't. It turned out he was innocent the whole time. So it takes about six months to write. It takes probably 600 hours of actually typing of, with fingers on keyboard and words appearing in my computer screen. But it actually takes a lot more time, probably three times that much time thinking a book into existence. But I write, it takes about six months more or less to write a book. Uh, the Joanna Brady book just before this, The A-List, took a lot longer to write. The Joanna Brady book I wrote after, uh, after finishing writing Credible Threat came together in a blink. So it's hard to tell. By the way, Judy, my name is Judith Ann. When my agent sent my first manuscript to Avon Books in 1983, the title page said, Unto Proven Guilty by Judith A. Jens. But my agent had been in publishing in New York and she knew how agents felt about um, female mystery writers. And so she changed the title page to read Until Proven Guilty by J.A. Jans. And uh, the second editor who saw that manuscript, John Douglas, called it Alice up and said, well, you know, the guy who wrote Until Proven Guilty is a good writer. And she said, well, what would you think if I told you the guy who wrote Until Proven Guilty is a woman? And he said, I'd say she was a hell of a good writer. Well, then the uh, marketing department got a hold of it. And my editor called me up and he said, the marketing people don't think that male readers will accept a police procedural written by somebody named Judy. So they're the ones who changed my, in, my pen name to my initials, J.A. Jans. But it's a lot easier to sign J.A. than it would be to write Judith N. And I always sign my books in red ink. And so they've saved me miles of red ink over the years by having me just write my initials. And as, as long as we're talking about my name, my, uh, my first husband's name was Jared Jans, but it was spelled J-A-N-C. So it was mostly mispronounced Jank. Uh, after he died, the kids and I got tired of being Judy, Josh, and John T. Jank. So we went to court and bought a vowel. I paid 400 bucks for that E in 1984. And when Bill asked me to marry him, I said, yes, but I just paid $400 for this name. And so I'm keeping it. <laughs> so he didn't change his name and I didn't change mine. So Jody, does that sort of answer your question? Yes, it did. And I can relate to several of the things that you have said including the thing about the professor, because I'm assuming we're of a similar age. And when I went to graduate school the first time, the professor the first night said to me, what are you doing in here? Only mar married people are on this campus. It's all men. Well, all I 
can say is we've come a long way, baby, haven't we? Yes, we have. Well, I think, I think our time right. is pretty much up. Thank you for coming, Judy. Oh. Thank you for your question. Okay. Any other questions? I was, was going to say, we do have a couple of, uh, some questions on the, um, on the uh, chat screen. Okay. If you click on, if you click on chat. Can you read them to me? I can't see them. Oh, okay. Uh, one is um, from, um, from Moro. Uh, before you became successful, how were you able to make a living to pay the bills? Um, well, for the first two years, I wrote um, between four o'clock and seven o'clock and sold life insurance during the day. Uh, but writing books was more fun than selling life insurance. And eventually, I, I lost that job. So then I married Bill. And for the first um, couple of years, he supported all of us, my kids, his kids, and so forth. And that was, that was how it started. We got married in December of 1985. And on... My first two books sold for a total advance of five thousand bucks, a thousand, uh, four thousand bucks, a thousand dollars on signing, and a thousand dollars each on delivery. And so that was the total advance. When we got married, I had had one book published; another one was due to be published. And so, for New Year's, he said, "What would you like to see happen this year?" And I said, "I'd like to make." $25,000 this year from writing books. And it was like magic. By writing down the uh, goal, I actually accomplished that goal. So for a number of years, the money that I brought in from writing was sort of fun money. We bought a hot tub one year with, with uh, my money. We took the kids to Walt Disney World one year with my money. We built a... a we remodeled a powder room with my money. So that was, Bill was really the major breadwinner. Then, so the first book came out in 1985. In 1995, a light came on in my career and Bill said, you know, from now on, what I earn is going to go strictly for taxes. So I think I'm going to retire. And he was able to retire at age 54. And I've been, I've been supporting the family ever since. But um, as I said, he's really good at writing checks. And, and that's not kidding because I write the books, but he keeps track of all the business parts of the business. And he pays the taxes and makes sure the mortgages are paid and and handles all those details. And if I had to do that, as well as doing my job, I wouldn't be able to. Another question? Uh, yes, it's uh, Adele, who is using Sean's iPad to everybody. Uh, and she says, hi, Judy, Adele here. Uh, will there be any more Beaumont books? Yes, there will, I'm pretty sure, but he's going to have to get in line and take a number. Because <laughs> people are saying, uh, Joanna is next up, but I'm hearing from people who are saying it's time to, to revisit the walkers. So I don't know what's going to happen next. And I grew up in a family of seven kids and our mother, the way we ate meals is everybody had to eat a little bit of everything, everything on their plate. And until your plate was clean, you didn't get dessert. And so I'm not allowed to think about what I'm going to write next until I finish writing what I'm working on now. I have to clean my plate of that book before I'm allowed to consider, but I'm pretty sure Bo will be back. Great. Um, okay, and then we have, uh, we, let's see, Nicole, Nicole said, this was such a great talk, thank you. Um, and uh, Moro says, uh, will any of your future characters be getting COVID-19? <laughs> Beats the hell out of me. <laughs> uh, the book I'm working on right now is set in uh, 
2018 as opposed to 2020. And so I'm not having to think about that. That, that is, for a long time, I was really stalled about writing this book because it seemed like the world was flying apart around me. And so by setting a book that is in the rear view mirror, that's really helpful to me. But for a lot of the time, all I've been able to write is just squeak out a blog. And my blog is posted on my website every Friday morning. And uh, it's a window on my life, what's going on in my life that week, the people I've encountered, uh, passing my 8 million mark last week was last week's. Wow. I have no idea what's going to be in next week's blog. But uh, that blog posts every Friday. And I try to find a little piece of good news to put in there because there's so much bad news out there. So much bad news. We don't need to hear all of it. And so I try to make my blog be a little bit of light on Friday mornings. That's great. Uh, and Mary C.E. says, this has been fascinating. Thank you, Ms. Jantz, for sharing so much of your life and experiences. And I definitely second that um, for everybody. Um, and it is, the time is up right now. Um, but uh, I would like to actually uh, share something here um, on our screen for a moment. Um, and uh, and what I was going to say is that you can buy any of these uh, J.A. Jantz titles and more at Annie's Bookstop in Worcester by visiting Annie's, which is at 65 James Street, Worcester, Mass. Uh, you can order by phone. And here's the phone number if anybody wants to take that down, 508-796-5613. Or by email. Um, we do take orders. You just sign, say orders at e anniesbooksworcester.com. And we do mail orders and curbside delivery also if you are concerned about that. Um, but we have, you know, we can get, we can get any one of her books um, that you, that you want. Um, we, we can research it and get anything pretty much. Um, so Credible Threat and After the Fire, um, which uh, she was talking about a lot today. Um, so uh, we'd like to thank you, J.A. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody really appreciates uh, what you, you know, what you're talking about. I, I certainly appreciated your life story. It was just amazing. And uh, it's, it's amazing to hear how your experiences really get into your books. Um, it, was, it was incredible. Well, um, I may not have been allowed in the creative writing program, but I'm smart enough to figure out you should write what you know. <laughs> so thank you. This has been fun. Thank you very much. And bye -bye. Jessica, Jessica says thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.